In the First World War, fighter planes had a bit of a problem. In order to aim their guns properly, the pilot had to look down the barrel directly, which meant putting it in front of him. However, this had the unfortunate side effect of tearing the propeller to shreds any time he wanted to shoot at something. Now, as any good military strategist might tell you, destroying your propeller and crashing is not the best tactic in winning a dogfight. So this problem was swiftly addressed with a synchronization gear, which basically meant the gun couldn't be fired when the propeller was still in the way. This method became incredibly popular, and soon aircraft shooting themselves down became a thing of the past. That was until the 1950s, when a test pilot named Thomas Atridge discovered a really neat trick you can do whilst in supersonic flight. In 1956, Atridge was testing the guns of an F-11 fighter jet whilst flying at Mach 1, the speed of sound. As per his test, he fired them for around 4 seconds before beginning a dive and heading back to the airstrip. However, the problem came when, around a minute later, or just under 3 miles later at that speed, there was a loud rattling noise and the canopy caved in, which wasn't an ideal thing to happen whilst travelling at the speed of sound 7,000 feet in the air. Hmm, that was strange. I must have hit a bird or something. What's wrong? Has there been any damage to the aircraft? As far as I can tell, just a dent in a broken canopy. I should be able to make it back to... Hmm, what's that noise? It was the engine. It had been damaged in the incident and could only output 78% of its maximum power without struggling. Which sounds like a lot, but it soon became apparent that it wasn't going to keep Outridge in the air long enough to get back. So he had no choice but to open the throttle and get back as quick as he could. Which went about as well as you might expect when your engine sounds like a vacuum cleaner sucking up gravel. With no functioning engine, the only option was to crash land in the forest just half a mile short of the runway. During which Outridge broke his leg, the plane had its wing ripped off and then caught fire, and when the rescue helicopter came, it almost broke its rotors off when it hit the trees. So that went well. So what actually happened? Well, it turned out it wasn't a bird. Yeah, it was a bullet. How did you know that? When the test shots were fired, the bullets were initially travelling at almost 3,000 miles per hour, but air resistance and gravity quickly pulled their path into a pleasing parabola, meaning the bullets and the diving jet were reunited only a few minutes after separating, which was dubbed a million to one shot, though Attridge later said he could replicate it quite easily if he wanted to. Seeing as how it occurred so early in the age of supersonic flight, it's easy to see how the idea of flying into one's own stream of hellfire hadn't really crossed anyone's mind before, and pilots from then on started banking after firing to prevent outraging themselves. And so aircraft shooting themselves down became a thing of the past. What? What do you mean it happened again? Just 17 years later, eager not to leave Atridge with all the glory, another test pilot, Pete Purvis, continued to modernise the art of the self shoot down using crazy new future technology, a missile. Purvis was testing a missile which ignited just a little bit too early after launch and, despite being inert, caused enough damage to result in a fire and the jet spinning out of control, subjecting both Purvis and his co-pilot to a force of 10G, before finally being able to eject and having to wait for a helicopter to come and rescue them from freezing cold shark infested waters. But really, it's lucky that Purvis was able to gain control of the aircraft just enough to eject, because as shown in his video on G-forces, Tom Scott demonstrated that the average person may reasonably lose consciousness at around 4G, and if a trained pilot is still conscious at 9G, their vision starts going black and it looks like their face is melting, which doesn't really make recovering a heavily damaged aircraft very easy. Although this is kind of what test pilots do, you know, test things and find out when they go wrong, it's pretty insane that both of these men so quickly found themselves in danger whilst just doing their jobs. But luckily, they both survived and lived to be remembered as the pilots who shot themselves down.